Turn in your Bibles to Luke 18. I was thinking when the choir was finishing up singing, I appreciate... Yes, I'm sorry, Sister Who. Yes. 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 That's right. If you didn't hear, she said, the tumors are shrinking. And keep praying. Let's pause and pray right now. God, what you have begun, continue. Lord, you have the last word. Lord, you're the sovereign Lord. You're the creator God. You're the maker of our bodies. You are the redeemer, Lord. We pray that you would continue to move and work and heal. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I was thinking right as the choir finished singing that I appreciate our church's hunger for the Word of God. And uh, I know you're not watching the clock. I'm a time conscience person. I really am. I scare myself sometimes. I can be out busy for hours, not look at a watch, and I'll say, it's such and such time, and I'll look at it, and I'm within two or three minutes. It's spooky. Uh, so I'm time conscious, but I appreciate a people that is hungry for the Word. Many Sunday mornings uh, when we have such a move of the Spirit, we we don't even get to pulpit till 20 or 15 till and 12, and yet you're here with the hunger for God's Word. And we don't want to be disappointed this morning. We want to open up our hearts and let God speak to us. Can you say amen? Get a bulletin. They're in the vestibule. Be back in service tonight. Come early and pray. There's nothing that happens in the life of the church hardly that thrills my heart like on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night to uh, get up in the prayer room and see it full of people praying because I know God is able to help us if we're praying. Amen. Luke chapter 18. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Two men went up into the temple. Uh, let's go to verse 9. Brother, do, do we have that? I somehow marked the wrong verses down. If not, that's fine. I'll read it and we'll catch up there. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. At this, he kind of looked out of the corner of his eye and said, or even as this publican. I'm not like them. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted." I want to preach this morning on how it all looks to God. How it all looks to God. And I believe the, the, the underlying message of everything that's said this morning is how we come before God is going to determine how we leave. How we come before God is going to determine how we leave. Father, help us this morning. Shut up my mind and heart to the truth. Remove every distraction. Lord, I pray that you would genuinely, Lord, move in a special way and that lives would be changed from having been in this service. Thank you for your spirit that's at work in our midst. Now, Lord, honor your word with your anointing. In Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. When you are married, you learn that women ask questions that are a minefield to try to get through. How many married men have discovered that? My wife will get a new dress and she'll put it on and she'll say, Do I look big? You can't even say no. 
Because if you say no, she'll say, oh, so I don't look big in this one, but I look big in that one, right? Is that what you're saying? So a few years ago, I've solved the problem when she puts on a new outfit and says, do I look big? I look at her and say, do I look stupid? (laughs) You see, she's not any different than the rest of us, or most of us, I would say. I've seen some that weren't. But most of us are concerned of how we look to others. Isn't that right? Have you ever seen yourself on video? Wasn't that a great experience? How many found that to be a great experience? I've, I've listened to people when they saw themselves on video, and they'll turn to their spouse and say, Is that really me? Is that what I look like? Oh. How many's heard that? You see how this Pharisee and this publican looked to themselves as they stood in the temple praying, wasn't how they looked to others or even to themselves. What they really looked like is what they looked like to God. Amen? You know, I have found this as a speaker. People somehow feel like they're inconspicuously anonymous in an audience, in a congregation. Somehow they don't think the person up here can see them. I mean, they don't think people see them when they talk or sleep or clip their toenails. They think they can do that in an audience and nobody sees it that's up here. But I can tell you, and I won't tell you all I've seen, but I've seen all kinds of things in my years of teaching and preaching. But there's something about being in an audience, people think they're anonymous. I've never been to one, but I know they have them. What about the fan cam? You know, they have at ball games. All of a sudden, they're... You know, and, and people all of a sudden see that they're on there. How many knows what that is? What if we had a worship cam? <laughs> and during the preach, and all of a sudden we focused it on different individuals. <laughs> How many vote for that? <laughs> I want to tell you something. There is a worship cam, and God's running it. And when Jesus told this parable of the Pharisee and the public and what God does through this story is he focuses his worship cam on two individuals, a Pharisee and a publican. And this parable lets us in on what the Pharisee and the publican looked like to God when they were in church, when they were in temple, in the temple. I want you to ask a question with me. I got to join you, but I want you to ask the question, what Does God see when he sees me in church? What does God see when he sees me in church? We've been in these parables for a while, and we always look at the context because I think that's important. But what is going on? Verse 9, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. You see, the context is Jesus had just given the parable about the persistent widow. And he was saying through that parable that when we come before God, we need to come boldly. We need to come with persistence. But he knew that some wouldn't understand that. when, When he emphasized through that widow, come to God boldly. Enter his presence boldly and persistently. He knew some would misunderstand that and think that boldness is arrogance and persistence is pride. I know some do. I've heard them preach. They preach many times today. Now listen, I wouldn't take away from that a bit. Jesus didn't either. We are the children of the king. We're to come boldly before his throne. But some misinterpret that. I've heard them preach. You just march right into the throne of God. You declare, I'm a child of the king. And God, because I'm your child, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. Listen, boldness is not arrogance and persistence. It's not pride. And so Jesus is speaking this parable to tell us, yes, I want you to be persistent. Yes, I want you to be bold in prayer. But that's not the same thing as arrogance in prayer. You don't come thinking of how great you are. You come beseeching the mercies of the Lord. And so Jesus is speaking to those who are prideful. They're self-confident. They're folks that sit in a church service or stand 
in worship and they're thinking I've spiritually got it made. I've got something others don't have. I have arrived spiritually. I've got things under control. I can handle it. I can figure it out. That's what Jesus, that's no way to approach God. Even no one that approaches God like that. Jesus said they trust in themselves. That person will not receive what they need from God. You don't come to God trusted in yourself. You come to God trusted in God. Hallelujah. It's impossible, Jesus lets us know, amen, to trust in yourself and not despise others. He spoke this parable to them that trusted in themselves and despised others. If a person trusts in themselves, they will look down on others. You see, being self-righteous isn't looking at God's standard and recognizing that you measure up. But being self-righteous is looking looking at others and assuming that you're doing better than they are with God. Again, self-righteousness isn't looking at God's standard and say, well, I measure up. Amen. Self-righteousness is looking at others and assuming you're doing much better than they are with God. It's sitting in a church house and say, others need to lift their hands. Others need the message that's being preached. Others need to pray. Others need help. But I'm doing fine. That person receives nothing from God. And Jesus wants us to receive from Him. Can you say amen? So that is what's going on. What is the earthly story? Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee. Could I have my Pharisee this morning? Not everyone get up. and no, I'm joking. <laughs> Here comes the Pharisee. Da, 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 you know, whatever. And the other, a publican. Everyone say it like you're spitting it a publican. Okay, that didn't, that didn't go over good. I was going to tell you this later, but you know what a publican is. It's a tax collector. So, <laughs> You know, Jesus sets up this story because he knew that people thought the Pharisee was a good man. And the publican, publican was a bad man. Now, you know, I want to talk just briefly about the Pharisee. You know, we immediately assume a Pharisee is bad. And the reason we do that, because from reading the Bible and through our, our time at church, when we think of Pharisee, we know that that's become a synonym for a self-righteous person, a, a hypocrite, a, of a fake, of a fake, of a holier-than-thou. And so when we hear the word Pharisee, we think bad person. But at the time Jesus was speaking this, Pharisees were looked up to. Pharisees were considered outstanding members of the community. They did a lot of good. Even they lived good lives. So you've got to keep that in mind this morning. In the parable when Jesus spoke it, folks were thinking, Pharisee, that's a good man. That's a good person. That's an important person. You see, this whole parable isn't about how one sees himself, as we're going to learn. Amen. Or even how others of the community see that person. This parable is about how God sees that person. And then there was the publican. Now in this election cycle, i got to make clear, this isn't Republican. It's publican. Someone made that mistake once. Isn't that right, Brother Norvell? Where's he, where are you at, bro? He's not feeling well today. Okay. In his Sunday school class. This is a public. As I said, this is a, in our terms, and I'm, I'm not looking, you know, people do their job, and I'm not, you know, against people, but we look at this today as an IRS agent and worse, maybe an auditor. You see, it's more than that he just collected taxes. A publican, a publican was a traitor to his nation. He was a collaborator. As a Jew, he was a collaborator with the Romans who were the conquerors and the oppressors of his country and his people. And so this publican, he was a hated fellow. He was looked on as he was, in truth, a corrupt public official that used his position to 
bilk money from the people. Now that does sound like a politician. But anyway, it was just a, a, a publican. And that's, a, that's the way he was looked at uh, amongst the Jews. A traitor, a corrupt official. Now I want you to notice that both of them showed up at church. Both of them went through the temple to pray. And I'm sure when the Pharisees walked in, all the people were glad to see that he had come to church. But when the publican walked in, the publican walked in, keep trying to get another syllable in there somehow, but when the publican walked in, they were all thinking, all those in the temple were thinking that he shouldn't be there. Why did he come to church? They felt like the publican defiled and corrupted and dirtied the precincts of the temple. I'm going to say right here before I go any further, may we never be like that. May we never get to the place that as a church we feel like there's some folks it'd be best if they just didn't come. Because that's what they were thinking that day about the publican. It'd be best if that fella just hadn't showed up. And then in verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as, look out of the corner of your eye, that publican. I mean, look at him pray. Look at him pray. I mean, he is spiritual. I, I mean, he's got it together. Holy, holy, holy. And, and, and it's, it, it's not a strange thing that they stood to pray. That was the custom of the Jews as to this day. You see a picture of the wailing wall, the remnant of the temple today. No one's seated down. No one's kneeling. They're standing in prayer. That's how they prayed. It wasn't that he was standing. It was his attitude. Now, I want you to know what it says here. It said, he said he prayed thus with himself. Actually, he was talking to himself or as he prayed he was thinking of himself now before we're too hard on him there's been a lot of us a lot of times when we thought we was praying we realized we were just talking to ourselves and thinking about ourselves I'm not talking about an egotistical way but how, how, how many's found that sometimes you've been really thinking I'm really praying I'm you know, you know I'm, and then you realize you're just talking about yourself or to yourself and his prayer, he, he, you know, he uses the word God like he's addressing God, but he's really congratulating himself. I mean, he's just applauding his spirituality. Amen. He was addressing God with his words, but his thoughts were his just thinking out loud of himself. I think even though he was talking to himself, he was probably also thinking how he must be sounding to those that were nearby. How that those around him were thinking, wow, that is a spiritual man. I mean, these sitting here, here in this Pharisee, pray they could they listen to his words and say now there is a spiritual man there is a spiritual man I always liked that story where you know a lot of traditions someone just prays out loud in church for everybody and they would ask this one young man to pray and he'd butcher the grammar and his expressions would be wrong and sometimes he'd break down just cry in the middle of it and so the people got disturbed and sent a delegation from the church board to go talk to him they went to his house sat down in his living room there and they visited a little bit and they said I want you to know why we're here you've got a lot of people uh, upset they're offended by your praying why are they offended the man said he was hurt because you used the wrong words your grammar is awful and you use some expressions they don't think they ought to hear in church and sometimes you just break down and cry in the middle of it we got to sit there till you get through crying and they went on and on and finally they looked at him and said well do you have anything to say he said yes I do would you go tell those folks that when I'm praying I'm not talking to them hallelujah it's encouragement to pray with one another but when we pray we're not talking to ourselves we're not talking to others we're talking to God amen if the Pharisee could only realize that and maybe there was a level where the Pharisee amen felt convinced that God was glad to hear from him and that God was especially privileged that he had showed up at the temple that is the Pharisee at church his mind was upon himself 
himself. He was thinking of himself, pleased with himself, praising himself. Look what he was doing at verse 11 again. The first thing and the first reason he felt righteous, he felt righteous and good about himself because he compared himself to others. He said, I thank God I'm not as other men are. I thank God I'm not an extortioner. I thank God I'm not unjust and adulterer or even as point at him, even as this old publican. He felt righteous because he compared himself to others. How many know the scripture says they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. But notice what he does. He doesn't compare himself to Brother Rose the Elder or Brother Lee or Brother Brock. He doesn't compare himself to some saint of God. Amen. He compares himself to the worst fellow in the temple. Even you know, folks do that when they want to feel spiritual. They compare themselves to somebody they know's doing bad. They compare themselves to somebody they know's backslid. They compare themselves to know someone they know is in sin. Amen. By comparing himself to that publican, amen, he was despising him. He was rejecting him. How many knows when somebody attempts to lift themselves up, they don't raise themselves any higher, they just push other people down. And that's what he, he didn't come, he wasn't any higher when he left the temple than when he came in. He had just pushed the publican down a little lower. So he felt righteous because he compared himself. Secondly, verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Secondly, he felt righteous and good about himself because he looked at all his religious works. And all his religious works. Now here's the thing I've got to make clear from the story because Jesus was. This was a Pharisee that had gone the second mile. Did you know as a Jew, the Old Old Testament only required one fast once a year. And here's a Pharisee, tell us about it, that fasted twice a week. I mean, he went the second mile. And I give tithes of all that I possess. Someone said, aren't you supposed to tithe? Yes, certainly. But that's not what it was. He had already given 10% of his income. But then when he went to the grocery store and he bought 10 bags of flour, he tithed on what he bought too, a consumer tax. We'll come to that in our, our country, but you just wait, you know. Amen. So he, he not only tithed of his income, he tithed of whatever came to him. If somebody brought him something. Now that's not bad. It just shows that he truly was a man that had a lot of religious acts. So he went the second mile. But verse 13, enough about that old Pharisee. He'll do his talking for himself. But what about the other man and the publican standing afar off? He would not lift up his eyes, but he smote his breast harder. And he said, God, he, I believe he was weeping. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful for me. Now, I want you to notice what the Bible said. The publican standing afar off. That bet he got to the furthest reaches. In fact, I'm going to move you up. He got to the furthest reaches of the perimeter of that temple. I mean, why? I believe one reason, he didn't feel like he was good enough to stand any closer to the Pharisee. He felt like he was so bad, he didn't fit in. He couldn't be around the group. But I believe it was more than that. He was a Jew. He knew what the temple was all about. He knew that in that holiest of holies was the throne of God, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. He knew knew that God was a holy God and he felt so wicked he felt so bad he wanted to come to church but he stood as far away from the holy of holies as he could I know they didn't do it literally but I believe before the day was over as far as the presence of God the one that stood afar off was the one that got to enter in and draw near hallelujah and so that was the publican he stood he knew his lifestyle was corrupt. Even you know when a person's ashamed, when they know they hurt someone, they'll do that. They'll bow their head and won't look at him. 
How many's dealt that way with even a child or another person? When they know they've hurt you, when they're ashamed of the way they, they'll drop their head and they won't. That's what he did. He didn't want to look up into the face of God. He knew he had done wrong to people, wrong to God. He'd broken God's laws. He'd taken advantage of people and hurt them badly. And only that, he knew he hadn't been to the temple very often at all, living his corrupt lifestyle, his extortionist lifestyle. And so there he was. Come back down here so we can see you beat your breast again. The Bible said uh, he beat his breast. He beat his chest. Uh, even why did he do that? Because in that culture, that was a sign of great grief, great sorrow. Now, here's the interesting thing. Men, on rare occasion, would show that symbol of their grief. But usually, most often, it was a woman that had this cultural uh, symbol the beating of her chest and the very fact that a man would be doing that in public maybe in private in private grief but that he was doing it in public shows two things shows number one that he was so filled with grief that all he could think about and sorrow and condemnation and guilt all he could think about was God and it also shows that he didn't care he got to the place he did not care what people thought of him. I mean, if he'd halfway been thinking, he would have said, what are people going to think? Here I've come to the temple and I'm beating my breast like a woman at a funeral. I'm talking about their culture, their time. I'm beating my chest as a woman at a funeral. What are people going to think? But I'm telling you, he had come to the point. He was so tired of his life, so tired of his problems, so tired of his sin, so tired of hurting people and hurting God. He came to the temple and he didn't care. He completely forgot about everyone else. The only thing he could think of is I've got to have help. I need God. Hallelujah. In other words, the Pharisee prayed conscience of how good he was. And the publican prayed conscience of how bad he was. Just stay right with me. What was Jesus driving at? Verse 14. I tell you, this man, the publican, went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I said at the beginning, I want to say it again. What Jesus was driving at is how you come to church will determine how you leave. Because he sees how you come differently than you yourself or others do. we got to realize this morning and thank God for the moving of his spirit. But it is possible to leave church in worse shape than what you came. If you didn't come humbly, you didn't let God help you, you'll leave in worse shape than what you came. I think it's important to realize that each of these took something home with them. They either took home God's approval or God's rejection. Brother Wilson, the Pharisee came righteous in his own eyes and left condemned in the eyes of God. But the publican came condemned in his own eyes. But he left righteous in the eyes of God. Oh, thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his mercy. If we look at ourselves through our own eyes, we'll never see God in our worship. But if we'll see God in our worship, we'll see ourselves as we appear to Him and not to ourselves. Oh God, open our eyes. You see, now here's the frightening thing to me. I believe this Pharisee over here, he has the same attitude that's fostered by the modern emerging church of our time. If you listen to the message, they'll lead you to believe that the most important thing about church is how you feel about yourself. How many knows I'm telling you the truth? The most important thing is not how I feel about myself. It's how God feels about me. Amen? How God feels about me. You know, we look at this Pharisee, and we immediately begin to apply him to those radical conservatives, even in our ranks. 
Because he, he boasted of all his ex- external works. And so we, could, we, we use the word Pharisee to talk to, about someone that is radically conser- conservative and they feel like they're so much better than everyone else because they're doing all the extra things. And there is some application to be made there. But in the context of that time, the Pharisee wasn't about someone that felt holier than thou. He was someone that felt like because of of all the extra things he did, he could feel good about himself. It's the fact, not that he did the extra things. The thing that made him a Pharisee is he went around feeling good about himself. I mean, that Pharisee felt he was perfect just like he was. He needed no no improvement and going to the temple he didn't go there to get help he went to the temple to parade before the people how good he was so I'm telling you if you're concerned about feeling good about yourself when you come to the house of God you can't get any help it's those that feel like they've messed up it's those that feel like they don't have any basis to stand on it's those that feel like they can't do it themselves it's those that don't feel good about themselves they get the help from God. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? How many's heard the name Kennedy? I'm not here to throw stones, but I tell you that name's in the news a lot. A lot of bad stories from that extended family. And I think one of the reasons is this. The patriarch of that family, Joseph Kennedy, Brother Brock has read a lot about him. But he told his boys one time, what you are isn't nearly as important as what you appear to be. Doesn't that explain a lot of behavior? I'm telling you, that's diabolical. Amen. It's not what we appear to be. It's what we truly are. Billy Sunday, that old great, he was a baseball player, became a preacher in the early 1900s. He said, a proud person is all front door. You go in and immediately you're in the backyard. (laughs) It's a facade. It's a front, Pharisee. Hey man, focusing on what you focus about. But oh, I came this morning realizing it isn't how I feel about myself. It's how God feels about me. That's all important. I want to mention again the prevailing philosophy, pop psychology, has got a hold of the church today. And they begin to teach and preach that the most important thing is that you leave church feeling good about yourself, having a great sense of self-worth. Why is it you preach that and people become more filled with anxiety, more unhappy, more unsatisfied. I'll tell you why. Because you can never get help from God feeling good about yourself. But the publican felt bad about himself. Show us how bad you feel. Publican, I mean, he felt bad about himself. He man, if you feel like you're okay this morning, there's no way God can help you. But if you come as a publican saying, I feel bad about some things, I'm telling you, God can help you. You read the gospel. Jesus is forever gentle with the sinner and hard on the religious person. Why? Because Jesus knows if they hide behind the religiosity, if they hide behind their good works, if they hide behind all the rituals of religion, they'll never get help. But if he knows if they'll just come as they are and admit what they look like in the eyes of God, then he can help help them then he can make a difference even today it would be brother Michael would be saying they're sounding like this I go to church three times a week I pay my tithes I sing in the choir I go or teach Sunday school even but that can become a smoke screen from what's really going on in his heart in his home in his marriage in his life Jesus said if you come and you are prideful you'll be humbled 
But if you'll come and humble yourself, I will lift you up. Hallelujah. I would have come humble before God, don't you? I'll just tell you how I like to come before God. I like to come praying the words of Scripture. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Oh God, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there is no good thing. Oh God, you remember my frame. You know that I'm a dust. You know that I'm a flower of the field that's here today and God tomorrow. But oh God, I need you. I need you. I need you. When I come to God like that, it's not long till I feel the lifting power of His grace and mercy and the kindness of His steadfast love. Oh, hallelujah. But if I come and play the game, well, I'm not as bad as this one. (laughs) I'm the one in the prayer room for church. I will one day be humbled. I've learned to pray a prayer. Lord, you listen, Pharisee? Lord, help me humble myself before you have to do it. I just told him in Sunday school, I'm not going to retell it, of a real humbling experience that I had. I'm really proud of that time God humbled me. Last of all, what should we do? Let's apply it. Church, what does this parable say to us? We should never assume that someone just shouldn't be in our church. That's what they were assuming about that old publican. What's he doing here? Secondly, church, we can't tell who's getting something and who isn't. I heard my dad say many times, he said, I've seen it over and over through the years. Two sinners come to the altar the same night. One kneels down and weeps and cries and uses boxes of Kleenex and gets up and jumps and shouts. The other goes down, just prays a little bit, don't see any tears, don't hear anything. He said, just a few days later, that first one that wept and cried and danced, he went out and he's done backslid. And the other one, I didn't thank God anything. He's still serving the Lord 40 years later. Now, not that you can't get something weeping and crying. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying, from our point of view, we can't tell if someone's getting something. Amen. You blessed me, Brother Cecil, this morning. We can't tell when someone's getting something or not. I wasn't talking about you. I'm just blessing, you know. You know, sometimes we judge folks. Say, well, they didn't get anything. They can't have anything. Amen. But God knows. Who got something? That Pharisee or that publican? Everybody else said, boy, that Pharisee. He, he, wasn't that a beautiful prayer? <laughs> wasn't that? I mean, he got something. Did you see the exhibition that publican made out of himself? Oh, but who got something? <laughs> And then church, I'd like to say, not just the Pharisee and the publican, but we all are observed by God in our worship. I like to pray this. I think you do too as a church. Lord, help my worship to be acceptable before you this morning. Amen. Doesn't that change everything? You guys need to start looking up behind these beams here. Or maybe you'll just see it on the screen. The worship cam. God's already got it working. And then to the believer, I believe this parable says to us, how we appear to God is far more important than how we appear to ourselves and to others. How many has ever asked God? It's a dangerous prayer. God, let me see myself as you see me. And then I believe this parable says to the believer, our wrong attitude can cancel out any good works. This Pharisee genuinely had good works. But in the eyes of God, that was all canceled out by his attitude. We've been talking about attitudes in our Sunday school class and children and marriage. Did you know that attitudes are really the strong, the spiritual strongholds of our life? And then to the believer, if we are righteous, we don't need to tell God. 
How, how many know sometimes we think we surprise God when we pray? God, you don't know how bad I'm having it. And God says, pulls up a chair and says, oh, I didn't know that. Would you tell me how bad you're having it? Hey, are you still listening to me, Pharisee? <laughs> He's too good to listen to me. Some of those, too. Anyway, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, if you're truly righteous, you don't have to tell God. In fact, if we think we're righteous, we don't even need Him. Right? And then I believe the parable says to the believer, we should approach God every time like we did the very first time. God, have mercy on me. You say, Pastor, I've served God 30 years. If you've really served Him, you're convinced you need His grace and mercy today as much as you did that day you got saved. What would happen this morning, Sister Brock, if we all came to the altar and prayed to God like we did the very first time? Hallelujah. Oh, but I would like to say to any unbeliever that's here this morning, it isn't what you've done, it's how you come. Hallelujah. I don't care what you've done. If you'll come humbly, sincerely, can I say it one more time? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then I believe the parable says to the unbeliever, it isn't the exterior of your life that God sees. It's your inner core. Amen. I, 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 you know, people, I, you know, we, we do. We put on a facade from our dress to our attitude to our conversation. Amen. Many times that facade is distracting from our real need, our real feelings. Amen. But when you come to God, He's not looking at your external. You know, you got to qualify everything anymore. I'm not saying there doesn't come a time in God's process that the external doesn't matter. I'm just saying when you come to God, He doesn't see like man does he sees into the inner core hey man he doesn't see you look like you're doing well or you're snobbish or you're this and that whatever it appears to man he just sees your inner core and sees your need and sees what you're thinking what you're feeling what you're going through what's troubling you what's bothering you oh I'm glad our God does see like that aren't you hey man he sees right oh all things are open unto the eyes of him we with whom we have to do and then I like to say or the parable says to the unbeliever it isn't excuses or justifications or comparisons or denials that God can forgive it's only the humble confession that he can forgive I just told my Sunday school class I want to say it again God cannot forgive an excuse God cannot forgive a justification God cannot forgive a denial but God can forgive a confession and a repentance oh hallelujah don't come justifying or excusing or I lived this way because of this or I did that because of that just come and say oh God oh God I did it it was wrong but I want help and he'll help you I hate to mess up whatever you have planned but whoever's doing the music this morning forgive me for asking this but could you sing in just a moment? Could you sing just as I am? Just as I am. How many knows that's the way we should come to God? Just the way we are. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. And last of all, the parable says to the unbeliever, music would you come? The parable says to the unbeliever, it's not about how bad you are. It's about how good God is. Oh, I wish an unbeliever this morning would really realize that you can say I can't be saved God wouldn't save me you don't know what I've done you don't know how bad I it's not how bad you are it's how good God is it's not how dirty your sin is it's about how powerful the blood of Jesus is it's not how wicked you've been it's about the grace of God and how gracious he is could you praise him hallelujah oh how let's just praise him hallelujah I've said this several times, but I want to share something very simple with you. 
Recently, I had someone come to me through the events of their life. They were crushed. They began to weep and say, Pastor, I've come to the end. My life is ruined. I'm broken. That's what they kept saying. I'm broken. I'm broken. I'm ruined. I let him share for several minutes and I looked at him and I smiled and I said, you're in a great place. I even saw a little anger. You know, some people think, you know, because of my dry humor, sometimes it's hard to tell when I'm serious or joking. I thought I saw just a little bit of rise up anger. And this person asked me, Brother Aaron, how can you tell me that? When I just told you what kind of place I'm in. Give me that last scripture, brother. I said, because of this, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. If you're broken, if you feel ruined, if you feel abused, misused, Michael, you're not acting like that publicly now. You... Because you've known the grace of God, haven't you? Did you see that change come over his countenance? I'm telling you, you feel broken. You're in a great place. You found that, didn't you? Didn't you, publican? You came broken. Didn't you find that scripture true, publican? You had a broken heart. I mean, you were bro- smiting your chest. Hey, Amen. You were contrite. You didn't come proud. What did you find? You found that the Lord came nigh. Hallelujah. Could you stand across the building? Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and thank Him for His mercy and His love. Oh, how, come on, thank Him, thank Him, thank Him, thank Him, thank Him. I really believe that from the beginning of this service, God really wanted to help someone. I'm going to ask everybody in a minute, and I, you know, I'm not trying to be facetious or rhetorical, but what if we would just come this morning just as we are? No pretense. No hiding anything. I'm not try- saying you have to tell your neighbor, but tell God. I want to open it first of all for people that are right now are in a genuine moment of crisis and you know you need help from God would you come right now maybe maybe you're not even a believer this morning but God is speaking to you are you here this morning and you need help from God you're going to come and you're going to be transparent amen I'm not talking about praying so your neighbor can hear but you say God I'm going to tell you just how I feel I'm going to tell you just what I'm going through I know you already know it God but I'm just going to pour out my heart before you are there others you'd like to come I mean don't miss out you're in a good place this morning if you feel broken if you feel despair if you feel to the end of yourself even you're in a good place because he's near those he's close to those have a broken heart contrast are there others would you come right now hallelujah oh I need you Lord I am convinced we'd have revival like we've never seen if every one of us would just let the facade come off. And again, I'm not talking about confessing and making a public display of things I'm talking about before the Lord. Just bring the facade down. Oh, hallelujah. I've told you many times, but every time I get on this theme, I think of when Hannah was about two or three. The way she would pray, when we pray over at the parsonage, she'd start praying, Lord, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you. I wonder if there's anyone that feels like praying that this morning. I want you to come right now. You just feel like coming and praying like the public. I need you, I need you, I need you. I've got to have you. I need you, I need you, I need you, oh Lord. I mean, how many is just going to come, begin to sing just as I am, without one plea, all over the house? Even you say, well, it's filling up. There's not room. There's room. Amen. Come, just as I am. That's it. Would you come? I need you. I need you, Lord. Don't just come. Pour out your heart. 
Come on, let's pray. This is serious business this morning. Make bare your heart. Make bare your heart. Make bare your heart. Make bare your heart. heart. Lord, this is the way it is with me. I need you. I've got to have you. Come on, let's pray, church. Let's pray, church. Lord, we come like the publican. We didn't cheat anybody, but Lord, we come like the publican. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. Do you need Him this morning? Come as you are. Come with your problems. Come with your struggle. 